Welcome. I'm Father Mitch Paklin. Welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from around the world. And first of all, I want to hope that all of you had a wonderful New Year's celebration, um, presumably a sober one. And also today is the Feast of the Holy Name of Jesus. This is a wonderful feast for us to remember. Too many people, even in the media, will use our blessed Lord's holy name in very nasty ways, in vain ways, not out of love of him, but out of their own need to use expletives or something. He's not an expletive. He is our Savior. And so we always treat his holy name with the respect due to the Redeemer. And it also happens to be, for us Jesuits, the titular feast. That means our order gets its name from Jesus, we're the Society of Jesus, so we celebrate this in a special way and urge everyone to love his holy name. Now tonight we have a guest. He is a cynical, cynical <laughs> psychologist to be sure. <laughs> Uh, that was a Freudian slip, <laughs> Dr. Freud, paging Dr. Freud. Uh, is a clinical psychologist. And I, took, an I took sadistics, too. <laughs> and he's an energetic speaker. He's the father of 10 children, of whom six were teenagers at the time. So he figured that he had suffered enough, received a few blessings along the way, to be able to write a book about raising teenagers. He says that perhaps no other time of parenthood than parenting teens is so intense in its highs and lows, its frustrations and rewards, and its sense of vulnerability and satisfaction. So please welcome the author of a brand new book, Standing Strong, Good Discipline Makes Good Te Great Teens. Dr. Ray Gurindy. You Dr. said that Ray? exactly as I wrote it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, uh, thank you for writing it, for one thing. Good to have you here with us, too. Appreciate Always you good to be with you, Father. All the way down from the snowy north. Well, I like Cleveland. the way you said around the world, though. I gave it a little more status. Yes, yes, Cleveland. <laughs> Home of Cleveland Clinic. Cleveland sports fans are 90% scar tissue. <laughs> <laughs> The, uh, but it's good to have you here. And uh, a few weeks ago, I had seen a report on a study about those who are using the more uh, psychologically correct and politically correct ways. Enlightened. Of, uh, enlightened, that, that would be another way they'd like to talk about themselves. Uh, methods of raising children. And one of the results of the study was not expected by the researchers, namely <clears throat> those kids who have the psychologically correct, politically correct style, tend to end up as followers. Whereas the ones who use more traditional discipline, stricter approaches, more limits on kids, they end up raising leaders. In looking at your book, I don't think you find that too much of a surprise. It's ironic, Father. The first thing you said was the researchers were surprised. Why would they be surprised? The wisdom of the ages says here are good ways to raise children. They decided, well, no, we have better ways to raise children. We have more enlightened ways to raise children. And therefore, we will find out that these children as adults are much more successful, much more like leaders, much more confident, competent. And when that didn't happen, so often my profession says, what? why is this? Mm -hmm. We thought we had better answers. Mm -hmm. It doesn't surprise me. There's a, uh, you might call it an indirect link, a vicarious link, which is if kids are raised well through methods that have worked for generations, one might say millennia, 
they have virtues and values that are more likely to help them navigate life and rise to positions of leadership. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, another element, too, that I, I think we need to point out. Uh, it struck me as a point you made in the book. You read the book. Well, you want to talk about you it, You look right? smarter. You didn't used to look quite that smart. See? See, that's why I read all these books. And so, <laughs> well, but one of the points that you make is the term teenager is a modern term invented in the 20th century. They didn't use that before. And the, a lot of times, and, and I've said it to uh, a lot of parents, that it's, it's hard to raise teenagers. And that's a, that's a new set of struggles, as we talk about. But in times or earlier, the older a kid got and the more they got into their teen years, the more valued they were because they were part of the family enterprise, usually farms. You know, back in the founding of the country, 90% were farmers. Having teenage, what we would call teenage sons, just adolescent sons, was an advantage. Adolescent daughters were an advantage. You know, for the whole family, they contributed early on from the time they could. It was just integrated into the family work. And it was a different attitude. Now, there's a dread. Why is this going on? Father, how long ago do you think a farm was sitting where you and I are sitting right now? 80 years? 100 years? 50 years? Yeah, yeah um, maybe. Uh, actually, this land right here was never a farm. Oh, the, okay. The soil's nearby. Terrible. But nearby, nearby yeah. Nearby. Oh, I mean, just, you know, not Do you suppose the farmer, when his son turned 14, said to his friend, I don't know what I'm going to do now. I guess he's a teenager. Uh, they get lippy when they're teenagers. They don't want to help. They struggle. You know, they're really into the uh, pop culture. That was unheard of. Yeah. So the point I make often is the experts have convinced parents that the teen years are developmentally tough. That's it. These kids turn into these much more in-your-face, kind of resistant, rebellion, kind of snotty kids. I maintain that it's more cultural. It's like, not based in genetics or biology. It is because there's hormonal fluctuation. Okay. Okay, body right. stretch, hormone surge. But the major part of it I maintain is the culture. The culture says, hey, you're 15. Look what I got for you. Do this, do that, have this, have that. Who's standing in the way? Mom and dad. Mom and dad are standing in the way. The relationship becomes adversarial. My mm -hmm. daughter, when she worked at a fast food place, came home one day, and she said, Daddy, not one of the kids that I work with speaks positively of their parents. And this was a basic suburban place with mostly two-parent families, and she was shocked. And I said, well, Sari, how do you speak? She goes, well, Dad, I had to be part of them, so I didn't speak positively of you either. I said, you're fired. <laughs> so, but that's, that was the point, which is so much of what parents are warned about. These teenagers, well, you know, you enjoy them now, because those teen years are right around the corner. It doesn't have to be that way, Father. It really doesn't. Mm -hmm. We can enjoy these years more so than we think, but the parent has to be in charge. That's one of the things. Uh, when you look at cultural messages, for instance, in commercials, in a lot of movies, in, uh, uh, well, I don't know a lot of movies because I don't go to movies anymore. <laughs> I don't, don't bother. Um, and, but a lot of TV shows and such, you'll see that the kid is enlightening the parent. Oh, dad, this is how your phone works or whatever. And that the kid 
is more intelligent and more at ease with the modern world than the poor, benighted parent who just can't figure it out. Oh, why? The, the dads especially. Oh, is that what that's for? Doofus it's, dad syndrome. Exactly. That's what it is. And this is portrayed, and even the way children in, the, the, even with something like uh, an old movie, a set of shows, The Little Rascals, they were wise guys among themselves, but when they were with adults, it was a different world. You know, they, they were in a different relationship. Today, kids will be the ones who try to come up with the wisecracks. Um, I'll never forget Sister Cordelia when I was in third grade. I didn't have her. No, you didn't. No, I didn't. Youngsters. And so, but she was really upset with the Danny Thomas show because the little boy in that, Rusty, would talk back to his father. And she would say, TV is giving a bad example. That's not how you talk to your parents. This is continued That was on. benign then. That it, was benign compared to what's there exactly. now. Exactly. This is part of the problem, isn't it? In terms of cultural messaging about how kids ought to be able to talk to their parents, and parents say, well, I guess. When I was in grad school, I was a young shrink, a shrinkling, <laughs> and I said that we, I, I said we had to take statistics, but we called it <coughs> sadistics. And we said that, of course, <coughs> anything outside the norm, two, three standard deviation outside the norm is not necessarily easily understood. I draw that parallel to parents. Many of the parents watching you, Father Mitch, are people who feel like they are besieged yeah. by the culture. Yeah. The culture critiques them, the culture second guesses them, the culture makes them feel like they're idiots and that they're not in touch. Mm -hmm. And this just, remember the movie The Fog? No. Okay, The Fog was this virulent kind of thing that seeped into every crevice and crack of this lighthouse. I draw a parallel to the culture. The culture is the fog. Mm -hmm. You can attempt to protect, but it's a fog. It just kind of seeps in and tries to shape your kid under your nose. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that parents struggle with a lot is how do you stand against that? How do you not give a smartphone when your kid is in the womb? Yeah. How do you say blessings out in a restaurant when your kid's gone like this and trying to not have anybody yeah. see you? Yeah. How do you have certain standards regarding movies or music when all of their friends have free license to this? And video games. And totally. And the shrinks, the shrinks have done a number on parents because we have basically told them, your children are going to resent you. Your children are going to rebel when they're older. They're going to puke up religion because you forced it on them. And that's what's happening. The parents are parenting skittish. They're not sure of themselves. Yeah. I always tell parents this. If your children go astray, you want to be able to say it's because they had to go through you, not because you stepped aside. And this is something that the, the, it's not only pop culture. One of the arguments going on in our society is that people in government, especially the schools in some states and folks in other levels of government are even saying, we will help your child have sexual organ mutilations because if you don't let them, they'll commit suicide. Yes. And they make parents afraid Very in much. many of these places when in fact, the suicide rate, if you do go through that, much is way, way higher. Forty-two percent after the surgeries, and folks in the state think that parents are the oppressor if they don't go along with it. And you see, <laughs> lot, the, the number of kids who identify as transsexual and all this has skyrocketed in the face of people in, the, in some of the school systems, not all, 
but in some of the school systems say, well, we'll, we'll, this is your right to do so, and we'll help you and protect you and take you from your mean parents in some states. That's why the title of the book is Standing Strong. Yes. Because not only does the culture disagree with parents who have traditional, moral, religious values, it does, but also their own peer group. Many parents tell me that their peer group, their own yes. adult peer group, mm -hmm. questions them, second guesses them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's people of faith too, saying, well, she's 13 and she doesn't have a smartphone. What is wrong with you? Don't you understand she's gonna get sneaky? She's gonna get deceptive. She's gonna get smartphones from her friends and she's gonna hate you for this. Had an interesting thing happen, Father. I was raking leaves. And a guy comes up to me and he says, uh, did you see a 15-year-old girl go through here? I said, no, no, not recently. He goes, my daughter ran away then. And he took off. About an hour later, I was, after my wife was done raking leaves, I didn't want to do it all myself. <laughs> I went to his door and I knocked on the door and I said, did your daughter return? He said, yes. I said, you took her smartphone, didn't you? He said, how did you know that? I said, because parents are so nervous about not acquiescing to what the culture says to do, because look, my daughter ran away. So I don't want that. I don't like her having a smartphone, but on the other hand, I really don't like her running away. So this is, this is the bind they find themselves in. Yeah. And I tell parents, you cannot parent afraid. If, if you parent afraid, take out the keys, give them the keys to the car and the house because you no longer are the parent. That study that you cited at the top mm -hmm. of the show, I'll take it a step further, Father. There is research that says when kids are raised by those kinds of traditional faith-filled strong moral values in the context of a very loving home. Not only do they go on to be better leaders, they go on to be much more well-adjusted people. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Now, we have the research on our side, but isn't it interesting, as you cited the, the worries from parents about if you do not acquiesce to a sex change operation or a sex uh, hormonal uh, offerings when your child is 12, you're running the risk. That's not what the research says. Mm. But yet the narrative says that, and it's enough to scare parents. Mm -hmm. Father, what do you think? Okay, I'll, I'll give you a, a small thing that one of the ways that experts confuse parents. Have you heard, let children express themselves? Oh, yeah. Of course, right? So parents believe that no matter how or what the child says or does in the way of expression. You know, Dad, I just think you're stupid. Well, that's expressing, isn't it? Yeah, that happened once. That would happen <laughs> once in the Pacwa household. <laughs> <One time. laughs> that, 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 so we knew not to even try it. See, and because you became a priest. There you go. So given that, many parents will say, well, I, 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 I want them to express themselves, but they take an enormous amount of abuse. Expression is not disrespect. And so what happens is the relationship deteriorates. She rolls her eyes at me. Father, one time I came home and my daughter, my wife, I, I noticed something, Father. Now I'm, I'm a highly trained professional. Yes, yes, yes so, so, of course. So I can pick up on very subtle things that the average amateur can't. <laughs> I noticed my wife was upset. She had our daughter by the neck saying, I do not like it, Ray, I am. I do not like it here or there. I do not like it anywhere. And I said, honey, are you upset? <laughs> and she said, it's Sarah. Randy turned to Sarah, Sarah was 13. Sari, after you're done there, I want you to clean out the garage, I want you to sweep it out. Then when you're done there, you come to me because I have a couple other chores I want you to do. Honey, what happened? 
My wife says, I gave her two hours worth of labor. Now, labor is you got to do what you're told. Yes. That's the consequence for what you did, labor. Now, by the way, any of you parents watching this who have teenagers, moms especially, your days of labor should be coming to a close. You got able bodies. Mm -hmm. What did she do to get two hours worth of labor? She rolled her eyes at me. Two hours of labor for, for rolling your eyes at your mom? Mm -hmm. Is that because rolling your eyes is so terrible? No, it's because your mom is so valuable. Yes. You know, Father, you say something to me, and I do this. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. That's just demeaning. It's disrespectful mm -hmm. completely. It's expressing feelings, but so many parents fall prey to that, and the number one problem the parents come to me with is disrespect. Number one. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. Arguing, rolling eyes. <laughs> yeah, right, mom, whatever. It's lame. And the parents think they have to take this because the experts have told them, let your children tell you how they feel. Well, yeah, you can tell me how you feel, but not like that. Well, there's an important distinction between expressing a feeling and expressing a judgment that by rolling your eyes and all these other things, you're saying, oh, mom, you're like so stupid. Yes. That's what that's yes. a judgment. That's not a feeling. And they haven't even done what a psychological they, test on mom to be able to establish that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, the, she keeps it up. They will, but <laughs> poor things. But here's a feeling would be to say, mom, I feel that uh, very angry because you are not letting me do what I want to do. That, yeah. That's a feeling. No, no parent would punish a child for that. No, but when the when the child does all these other signals uh, that say you're, you're ridiculous, mom. Exactly. That's a judgment, not a feeling. This is something uh, when I'm doing marriage prep, I try to get a, the couples to learn to make that distinction that if you judge somebody, they automatically have to become defensive. That's, that's the only logical response. But if I express my feeling that this is, I'm angry at this, I'm I don't hurt, understand it. Uh, th that, there's that, but I'm, and I'm hurt because I don't understand it. Uh, those are feelings. Then you can start to share back. Uh, that can evoke a, a, a sharing, whereas a judgment automatically brings defense, and that's when the clash let's, necessarily. Let's say happens. that a parent has a house rule, and the house rule is no disrespect. To me, to you, to your siblings, no disrespect. Now, the first thing they're going to get confronted with by many pop psychology notions, is that you're too strict. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is not realistic. Well, you have to have a standard to at least reach for. So it's not too strict, it's a standard. Isn't that interesting, Father? We've taken standards and made them too strict, first thing. So and, and therefore impossible. Yes. So therefore, parent, you are wrong and you're going to frustrate your child and you're going to have all kinds of psychological ill effects and he's going to be sitting on some talk show 22 years from now talking about you and all the ways you ruined his life. <laughs> Secondly, let's say the parent says, okay, new house rule. Wait a minute. Did your parents say that about you? You're on this talk show. No, they did. My, my mother was Italian. She was never bullied by anything that I said. <laughs> she, <laughs> I remember one time she was stirring spaghetti sauce with a wooden spoon. I was about four. And I looked, I said, hey, that's for my behind. Don't use it for that. <laughs> so you've decided we're going to have you write handwritten apology, disrespect of any kind, rolling eyes, yeah, right, you're lame mom, whatever, anytime. 200 word apology handwritten. Now I have had experts confront me with this. First of all, they say, well, you're gonna make him hate writing. Uh, it's no, there, there is no research anywhere that says that. You're going to write, you got to practice. You know that, Father. You write dozens of books, you got to practice. You get good at it. Exactly. Second of all, they say, 
You're not teaching them respect. All you're doing is putting a punishment on it. That's all. You need to, to teach them to be respectful. And here's what I say. How can you have a respectful relationship if disrespect is allowed? What you're doing is eliminating the disrespect so you can have a warmer relationship. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult for a parent to like a kid who is allowed at any time to be nasty to him. Yep. Very difficult. Well, that's, it's not a likable behavior. <laughs> it's just that plain and simple. Do you have, I got to believe this, I got to believe that you have parents coming to you in confession. Bless me, Father. You know, before I had children, I was pretty nice. <laughs> and now I'm not pretty or nice. <laughs> you know, because they, they get, they, they're upset because the way they talk to their kids. But the problem is they're allowing the children to be that way because they've been told they better. Or maybe they're lazy about it. Or maybe they just think, well, he's not throwing bricks at me, so I guess rolling eyes isn't too bad. One of the most common patterns I come across in counseling and such is when uh, is among moms because they they love their kids, and the kid will do something bad, and they'll just say, "No, stop it! That's just stop me! No, stop it! Stop it!" And after they just keep letting it go, letting it go. I said, <laughs> this is an explosion. And then they're worried about, I'm so impatient. No, <laughs> you should <laughs> nip it at the beginning. <laughs> Start off with the first time that you, you tell a kid ahead of time, if you do this, you will get this consequence. And the kid. That's so throwback, Father. I know. That is so throwback. It is. And. Furthermore, it works yes, because, it does. because the kid will do it immediately. I asked 100 parents one time, when do you decide to discipline? Do you know the most common answer? When I've had enough. Yeah. And I said, well, wait, wait, you discipline because it's wrong or you're trying to teach, not because your own emotion has hit the peak. That's what I oftentimes will talk about with patients, uh, with patients, with you know people that I counsel, as child abuse. If you are disciplining because your feelings have had enough, then it's not about the kid anymore. It's about your feelings. That's abusive. Whereas if you set a principle, say this is the consequence for this behavior. And the kid tests they have to. They will test they have to, and they'll test it at least twice, if not one or two more times. And you do the discipline. You, do the, you did this, here's the consequence. You did it again, here's the same consequence. Then they say, oh, okay, that's the consequence. So then they stop. Do you remember the look? <laughs> Maybe. Okay. <laughs> Why did the look work? Because you knew mom was about to go over the edge. Classical conditioning, right? Yeah. Look paired with discipline a number of times. Pretty soon you don't need the discipline anymore. The look is enough, correct? Yep. yep. Is the look still around? Oh, I think so. Uh, I've. How common? I don't, that I don't know. <laughs> you know, I don't hang around with a lot of well, people that have the look. most of the time, if a parent looks at a kid, the kid's thinking, what are you looking at? Oh, the kid gets the look. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. The kid, yeah. so the look worked because there was authority, quiet, loving, confident authority. Not a bad mm -hmm. word, the experts, authority's a bad word, punishment's a bad word, discipline's a bad word. Quiet, confident, loving authority. Mm -hmm. And I always tell parents this, if you have that kind of authority, you don't have to discipline as often. Yeah. If you don't have it, you are constantly. Exactly. And the, the parents are constantly the ones who are getting inc incrementally upset instead of saying, you know, when I, I saw this when I taught high school as well, that, you know, if you set the, dis the, the, 
this is the wrong behavior, this is the direct consequence. I never got upset anymore. I started off teaching in 72 at a high school. And, you know, the, the, you know, we had been given all these books saying exactly the same thing after finally teaching about two or three years. I said, this is stupid. It doesn't work. They're, you know, you have to have. And once I did, I never got upset again because I wasn't the one dealing with the, pro the consequences. They were, and I didn't care. If you go all the way back to the doctrine of fallen human nature, I will. We recognize that kids are naturally resistant. They want to do what they want to do. That's who they are. In our modern, more enlightened way of looking at things, where we say kids are naturally cooperative, they naturally want to get along. <laughs> <laughs> well, then of course, uh, using constant reasoning or I messages or win-win scenarios or, or no, you, no you messages, or give choices, the child should respond, Father, thank you. I've been so blind. Of course, you make such perfect sense. Let's hold hands, sing Kumbaya around the campfire. So what tends to happen is if you start with the wrong view of human nature, you do things that get you further and further away from how to raise this child. Mm -hmm. I always tell parents, I really don't care all that much about what your kid misbehaves like. The problem is, what do you do about it? Right. There's the difference. Yep. We have to take a little break right now, but uh, we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. If you want to listen to Dr. Ray Gurendi any time, then you can go to the Dr. Ray podcast, and the doctor is in radio show on EWTN On Demand. You just go to ondemand.ewtn.com, ondemand.ewtn.com, and you can have more of him than even his wife tolerates. <laughs> so anytime you want. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes with more Dr. Ray, so please stay with us. Welcome back. We are discussing standing strong. Good discipline makes great teams by Dr. Ray Gurendi. And this book is available at EWTNRC.com where it is item number 82651. 82651. Boy, I'm way far down there. I was hoping it'd be like item number four. Or something like that. I'm sure. However, it's not. Whoa. <laughs> but as you keep writing more books, the numbers will get bigger and bigger. Now, one of the th we were talking before about the discipline and how kids, you know, will resist. It's part of so they are. human nature. Yeah. And you you see it in the animal world. You know, when when I'm out uh, at you know my friend's ranch and stuff. And we, we used to raise cattle, my, my family did. And you'll see bull, you know, calves will lower their head and run right at their mother's head. When she's bending down to get some grass, they'll just go there and knock, them, knock themselves out. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's kind of funny, except for the calf. But he learns not to go and butt his mom. But, you know, this is what kids do across the species. And... I have used this analogy for decades that it it's a kid trying to do moral isometrics. That isometric exercises are a way that you can say get inside of a door, a, a doorway, and you can push against it 
in various stances, you know, uh, how you want to. Kind of a Samson thing. Yeah, and you push there, and that actually builds muscle when you don't have weights to lift. It's the same idea of resistance. And every kid is pushing against the parents. The key is twofold. One, the parents have to be the two doorposts. They have to be as firm as a doorpost. And the kid will push against you. And they, they have to, it's good for them. At the, the second issue is the door has to fit the kid's size so that the kid can reach the two ends. So the, you don't tell a four-year-old, you can't drive my car unless you fill it with gas yourself. That makes no sense. It's not appropriate for him because they're not going to drive yet. But you can say you have to put your toys away or else you can't play with them. That you can make as a rule. And if you make your rules too open-ended, the kid can't reach the other side and will never push against you, but they won't build up more muscles because in that process of pushing against their two firm, well-defined parents, they're building up moral muscle. They build it by resisting you. So I tell parents, don't say, why do these kids argue with me? Why do they push it? They have to, but they have to lose the argument. You're smart, way smarter than they are, and you know right from wrong. So let them push, but you be firm because you are intelligent. That is what I try to communicate. And, you know, the, the surprise, but it's, it works out. One of the things that I address heavily in the book yeah. is that if if you want to raise, I'll, I'll, I'll ask parents this. I said, do you want to raise an average kid that people look at and say, ah, just a basic, basic kid, they're average, no better, no worse than pretty much everybody else? Or do you want to raise a one in a hundred? Now, yes, everybody right, right. says one in a hundred. Everybody says that. Mm -hmm. Seeks God, high character, moral virtue, responsible, everything. I said, then you better be a one in a hundred parent. And if you're a one in a hundred parent, you're not going to be understood by many of those other parents. Yeah. They're gonna question you, and your kid is gonna question you because he's saying, how can all those people be wrong, Dad, and you be right? So I tell parents, if you want to raise that kind of child, be braced. We, parents are gonna have to push against the door frame because we're, un we're unlike many. You know, my 14-year-old my doesn't have a smartphone. Well, now he's in, the, he's in 1%. I'm going to have to deal with that. Mm -hmm. I don't allow him those video games. So he wants to go over to his buddy's house because his buddy has them. And I said, now what am I going to do about this? Okay, if I, if I don't allow that, people are going to say, you're constricting him. You're making him rebel. He's going to rebel. Just like all the parents watching this who have heard this, Father. You know, Mom, why I don't go to church? Because you forced me to go to church. That's why I don't go. Now, that's nonsense. That's raw nonsense. That is not why they don't go to church. Many other reasons uh, among, among the top is I don't want to. Yeah. But what they do is they, they play upon the old, you made me, and that's why I don't want to. And it's your fault. It's your fault. I can't tell you how many parents are bullied by that, how many feel inept, guilt-ridden, scouring the past. What did we do wrong? I wanted to pray the rosary in Aramaic, kneeling on broken glass. Their father <laughs> let them sit in the couch. Spiritual sloppiness, that's what it was. <laughs> exactly. So I, I tell parents, I, many of the people who come in my office will say, I, I, I'm, I'm getting besieged. And one of my therapeutic goals is to get them to have enough confidence to stand up against those ideas that are, that are buffeting them. Mm -hmm. And if they can do that, and, and even if it doesn't go in the way they want it to go, they can at least live with themselves and say, I loved with all my might, and I stood strong with all my might. Yeah. And it, it, this is uh, a, 
something we have to watch for is that the kids will try to manipulate your guilt feelings. Get out! I know, it's hard to believe, oh. but they do. And the parents have to understand authentic guilt. If you, you know, go into a rage and abuse your child and call them all these nasty names and beat them with sticks and, you know, until they're bloody and then you're that you're guilty. That's child abuse. But if you are giving clear values and you know that this is good, holy and true, you're not guilty. And you don't take that guilt feeling from the kid. It is one more way for them to push against the door. And you say, as my father would say, I'm not your friend. Make your own friends. I'm your father. Now, later in life, we did become friends. But not when I'm growing up and, you know, trying to do my own thing. He needed to be my father more than my friend. And that was a very important distinction that he made. And he, he didn't care about, you know, if I was upset at something that they was They didn't wrong. worry about that then, mm -mm. Father. They, mm -mm. they were not mm -mm. bullied by this idea Bingo. that I'm going to set in motion a chain of psychological pathology in this child. And it's going to pop up when he's 27 and he does this with his life. Mm -hmm. And where did I go wrong? Yep. What did I foolishly miss? And because of that, they're, they're afraid to be confident, to make the kind of decisions. I had a mother say to me one time, well, if it was up to me, I wouldn't let him. I just looked at her. I said, Who, who's it up to? What did she say? Well, she looked at me like I... I, I I never thought of that. What she was really saying was all these notions, these modern notions of child rearing, I, I don't agree with a lot of them. If it were up to me as a parent, I would do it this way. But they say, don't do it that way, because if you do, this is what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And she said, so if it were up to me, this is what I would do. And I said, it, it is up to you. I think that's, you know, one of the important things is giving parents that permission. permission to be able to be the adult in the room and that the pseudo adults that children are portrayed as in the media is just that. It's pseudo. It's like a dog walking on its hind legs. It's not something that looks really that good. You're amazed that they try it, but it doesn't look that good. It can't last very long. And it doesn't last long. They cannot sustain pseudo-adulthood. You are an adult. You've gone through a lot to become married and a parent and raise kids and finance them and all the great stuff you know how to do. Use that you know, and be confident in that and pray you know, to God a lot. Listen, what does our Lord tell you about what he wants you to be as a parent for that child? Not what the culture wants you to do. One of the ways that parents get confused is they are told it's a phase. <laughs> it's just a phase. You know, four-year-olds throw fits like that. Fourteen-year-olds get snotty and surly. They get moody. It's just a phase. Yes. You got to ride it out. It'll pass. A very, very popular sitcom lasted several years. The family was raising three children. Two of them were teenagers. And the teenagers were just incredibly disrespectful and snotty. But the whole message of the show was, this is the way it is. This is what they're like. Ride it out. Don't worry about it. It's going to change when they're 22 and they become human again. And I always tell parents, it may be a phase, but it's not going to go away unless you deal with it. Bingo. It's like riding Bronx. You know, yeah, they're going to buck. 
but you have to stay on if that bronc is ever going to learn to be a horse you can actually ride. It's, yeah, it's a phase, but you got to ride it out and hold on to the reins. Every kid is different to race. I always tell parents, some kids take this much parenting. If you're parenting here, you got twice what you need. Some kids in the same family need this much parenting. Mm -hmm. If you're parenting here, you got half what you need. So a parent will say, well, you know, I, it, it, it can't be me. It can't be me because I have two other children that are not like this. I said, well, that, that's true. That's true. But, but this one is. So as a parent now, you're going to be asked to be stronger, to be more loving, to be more perseverant and follow through. You have to. The other, the other child was a freebie from God. The mulligan round. He said, here, play with this. I'll, I'll save the real kid till later. You know, and... <laughs> It's something that it, it sometimes takes parents a while to adjust to. My, my first 13-year-old never talked like this. This one, every time she's breathing, she's disrespectful. Okay, now you're in a position to have to do something about it. Mm -hmm. Notice I said something about it. A parent will come in my office and say, he's so incredibly disrespectful. I'll say, well, what do you do? <laughs> I tell him, we don't tolerate that talk, young man. So what do you do? Well, he knows. He knows I'm not going to put up with it. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? Well, he's heard from me enough that I'm not going to take that kind of talk. After about the fourth, so what do you do? <laughs> they finally get it. It's like, oh, wait, I can't just talk and tell him don't be like that. I have to actually put the effort into doing something about it. Yeah. That's... It. And it, it, uh, parents know this, but even if you have twins or triplets, they come into this world with their own personality. The, it's not a blank slate. No, it isn't. It's a, the, in, uh, moms will talk about how in the womb kids act differently. Some are more running around in Those there. are some of the bulls that, that run yeah, into yeah. this. And, and some are calm. And, you know, the, it, and a friend of mine is a neonatologist. She delivers babies sometimes 21, 22, 23 weeks, you know, and they have a personality. Some of them come out smoking a cigar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm mom. And telling her what to yeah. do. But they each have a personality, and it's not the same. And so a parent is always not creating a personality, but interacting and forming what's already there. That's it. I always tell parents, some children will readily absorb what you're trying to teach them. Other children, it will seem like it's, it's just bouncing off them. Yeah. And so in some respects, they blame themselves that somehow I did something wrong. It's, Father, it's what I call formula parenting. Mm -hmm. The experts have kind of said, if you do it right, if you do the proper techniques, the proper strategy, the proper reasoning, you can shape a child in any direction you want. And if that child doesn't go in that direction, obviously you didn't do it right. Mm -hmm. You missed something in the formula. Mm -hmm. When in fact, it's exactly what you said. It is an, it is an interplay, personality, parenting. It's this interplay that goes like that. You know, Father, my 10 children are adopted. Yes. And I needed the tax deduction. Yeah. People say, no, I'd adopt. I said, ah, tax deduction. Plus, you so were looking for some sports, material. sports teams. Material. Oh, yeah, material. Yeah, I, I kept on, when, when you adopted, did they sign a release that you could talk about them? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, it's too late now. They're all grown, and I've written three of them out of the will. No. I, no. <laughs> so their personalities are a scattergram. There, there is no, there's no genetic line that runs through those 10 kids. They're, they're like this, mm -hmm. you know, and each personality was different. Absolutely. Some of them said, Dad, what you say makes sense. Thanks. And others said, that looked at me like, you can't actually think that. Just, and I had to deal, and my wife had to deal with whatever they presented us with. Yeah. But I always exactly. tell parents, you want to raise a God-seeking child then you recognize that much of the culture is not going to agree with you. And you have to know that or you will second guess yourself every step of the way. 
And another part of that, a corollary to that, is you begin that while they're in the womb. Yeah, I tell go to your womb. I always tell them that. Yep. See, that's the first line of discipline. Go to your womb. That, <laughs> I was wondering when you were going to get that. Yes. I didn't want to have to repeat it. What you, you remind, it makes me you, you evoke for me what my mother did. But my mother yelled at us in English. That was a yellow <laughs> alert. When she started yelling in Polish, look out. that was a red alert. She regressed. I, like but that. I haven't regressed to that yet. At any rate, no. But from the earliest beginning, you start to set a the interaction, the relationship, but also your own love of God and his commandments and his truth and beauty is what you communicate to the child from the beginning. And it is part of a consistent pattern. You don't wait until they're, oh, I'll wait till they're 18 before they get baptized. They so they can up, make yeah. Mm -hmm. All that, no, you, you start teaching them right from wrong and why right is right and wrong is wrong. And in, in a godly context, and prepare them for each new state and ride the bronc through the you know, terrible twos and all the other stages they go through. And, you know, eventually they come out as great, great leaders. You know, that, that's the, that one in a hundred that you're talking about. Also, as a supplement to your book, um, I, I'd like to recommend uh, another book um, I always forget the author's name, but it's called The Dumbest Generation. Do you know I that book? I haven't heard of that, no. Oh, it's a great research. That's not my generation, is it? No, no, much la after your, oh, your, your you. generation is old. The <laughs> well, I, is thank, the, you, thank you, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's the generation from the 90s when they started getting cell phones. And it talks about the importance of cell phones. Jean Twenge, was that her name? No, 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 no. it's a, it's okay. a man. Um, but at any rate, this book, The Dumbest Generation, and now he's done a follow-up, uh, um, more research. It shows that by using the phones and letting them have all this, they do better. The, when, once they start with the phones, their grades go down mm -hmm. and their uh, mm -hmm. IQ. Uh, Bauerlein, Mark Bauerlein, that's it. Did, uh, you, did you just have one of your producers? Yes, my give producer's that? brilliant. <laughs> I saw you took a, took a quick yes, look at yes, the teleprompter. Yes, of course. It's pretty sneaky. He knows I don't remember. <laughs> That's the problem of raising old guys. Parents will say to me, what's the one thing I can do that will make my journey through these teen years more difficult? I say, oh, hands down, smartphone. Now, you, you, you say, well, okay, wait a minute, Dr. Ray. What are you, what are you saying, until they're 18, until they're 16? First of all, not early, not cultural early. The average smartphone is now 9 to 10 years of age. Yep, that's what exactly. It is. That's what Bauerlein also okay. said. So given that, if you go, say, to 14 or 15 or 16, what kind of safeguards you got on that? I mean, there's ways you can safeguard that phone so that they can't go anywhere in the world that you don't want them to go. You can do that. I saw a statistic. 50% of parents put no safeguards yep. at all. None. Zero. And a lot of times, Catholic parents are among that group. You know why? My child wouldn't do that. Yeah. He wouldn't download pornography. Yes, he would. Yeah, I know. So I tell parents, that's the one thing. And they will come and say, well, but, 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 that, but that's the way they socialize. I go, well, now we're going to have to. That's we're gonna the have problem. To. That's what Bauerlein brings out. Mm -hmm. And the socialization harms them. Yeah, well, sure. Yeah, what research. kind of socialization? Yep, yep. No, these are, these are some of the things. Uh, I, I want to recommend your book strongly. I think... You know, you deal with concrete cases and situations that you get from your own clients and from letters and such. And my children. Yeah, and <laughs> I said you want to bring those poor <laughs> people up, but <laughs> what they've gone through. But they. <laughs> but you know, this is a use, really useful tool for parents to say, you know, yeah, I'm the parent, and that's a great thing. I want to recommend that if you want more of, about Dr. Ray Gurendi and his work, go to drray.com. And again, this book that I'm strongly recommending is called Standing Strong. Good discipline makes great teens. 
get it from EWTNRC.com, where it's item number 82651. 82651. I'm 82,000 items down the list. Thank you. <laughs> Good county. Thank you for being here. Father Mitch, and always a pleasure. Same here, and may the Lord bless you and all of you out there, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And remember that our Lord inspired Mother Angelica to make this network brought to you by you. And we ask that you just remember to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill. And in that way, we'll be able to pay all of our bills too. God bless you all and thank you.